One of America's leading authorities on innovation is Laura Tyson. Laura was in the Clinton uh, presidency the chair of his uh, economic advisors and she is a professor at UC Berkeley of Economics. She's done a great deal of thinking about how American economics can become more innovative and learn from Silicon Valley. Laura, welcome to TechCrunch TV. Thank you very much. So Laura, you have ricocheted from Berkeley, from Silicon Valley yes. to Washington DC and I know you've done a lot of thinking mm -hmm. about what America needs to learn from Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think that it's, I look at Silicon Valley and I think of it as part of, a very important part of a system of innovation. And the system of innovation uh, starts with uh, basic research and universities and training people who then end up uh, as the entrepreneurs or innovators in Silicon Valley, leading to connections through the venture capital. So I'm very worried about, very thoughtful about the basic research process, the diffusion process into the commercial sector. Uh, clearly, Silicon Valley grew up in Silicon Valley because of the connection to the universities. And I would emphasize, again, if you think of a company like Google and you look at its foundation, you will see the National Science Foundation at Stanford in a research project and supporting graduate students at Stanford. It ended up being Google. That diffusion process with the venture capital community is very, very important. So you're not in the Peter School, uh, the Peter Thiel School of Thought, which suggests that young entrepreneurs like Mark Zuckerberg should drop out of university? You know, I Individuals' stories like Mark Zuckerberg's or Steve Jobs are stories of creating great, um, great commercial successes. They are building on technological and scientific and basic research breakthroughs that would not exist if there were not funding for research and people doing serious disciplinary research in universities. So the ideas, the seeds of the ideas, the foundations of the ideas come from, I think, uh, the science and technology that is born in basic research and training in universities. That doesn't mean that somebody can't take some of that and go out and start a terrific enterprise and not themselves be an innovator in terms of the basic underlying science, but an innovator in terms of taking knowledge from the basic underlying science, creating a new product, a new process, a new brand, a, a, a new uh, thing that creates services for people that they didn't have before. Can innovation be taught, Laura? Um, I don't think that innovation can be thought, taught. I think that we pride ourselves in the United States, and I think it's correct, to say that we uh, do encourage people to be uh, questioning. We do encourage people to take risk. We do understand in our society that you can fail and pick yourself up. When I first started to be dean at London Business School in London, and I would travel to other parts of the world, the concept of failing fast or failing forward, I used to call it failing forward. You'd fail, get up, and when you got up, you'd be ahead of where you started. That is a very, um, it is a concept we are very familiar with in the United States and in our innovation culture and is really foreign and strange and not accepted in many other cultures. So I think we, we have a system which creates values and energy and um, creativity and openness to failure and to entrepreneurship. I don't think you can actually teach the innovation process, so I would make that distinction. How would you like to see the ability to fail fast and accept failure um, and take risks? How does that get taken from Silicon Valley and brought to the rest of America? Um, I think it exists more in the rest of America than we in California sitting near Silicon Valley think. <laughs> um, so I you're think suggesting that Northern California is a parochial? <laughs> and I, I'm considering there's a little bit of Silicon Valley-itis, okay. if you will. Well, I would um, and if you, uh, you know, I happen to have a, I have a brother who's involved in b basic cancer research and has been all of his life. And he knows all of the 
researchers around the country who work on certain kinds of cancers. There are large numbers of them spread throughout the United States and they are innovators and they are taking risks and they are devoting a time to scientific inquiry which may absolutely fail and uh, they are being supported uh, significantly by the universities they, they sit at or the National Science Foundation at the federal level. So I, I just think we should be, and then I would just go to the other side of it, which is there are lots of innovations in the, that are not tech innovations, that are important innovations. You know, we tend in Silicon Valley, again, to sort of think, well, can big firms innovate? Well, one of the examples that I think has gotten a lot of attention, deservedly so, is that a huge firm, this, uh, the first, second largest uh, international investor in the world, GE, has made significant innovations in its health equipment that come from its involvement in other parts of the world. That's a huge benefit to the other parts of the world and will be a huge benefit in the United States. Laura, a couple of economists at MIT, I'm sure you know them, uh, Andy McCaff uh, McCaffrey mm -hmm. and Eric, Eric yes. Bryn Johnson, mm -hmm. came mm -hmm. out with a pamphlet a few months ago, I had them on the show, that argued that in spite of all our tech advances and revolutions, the technology industry, and particularly startups like Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, are not generating jobs. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they're very concerned about yes. that. Where do you yes. stand on the relationship between technological innovation, the mm -hmm. creation of wealth, certainly for small groups of individuals in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. and the generation of jobs in America, and for that matter in the world. Right. Well, well I, do, I do worry about this. I worry about it in uh, two ways. If I, if I think about just the U.S. for a minute, I do think that the U.S. has uh, retained its very um, strong innovative position, but has been losing its ability to capture for its uh, workers, uh, for its communities, some of the value of that innovation because parts of it very quickly leave. I mean, that is, if you think about innovation in, in this country, think about a, a, some intellectual property that's developed where you think there is going to be a return on it. What do you do with that property? Well, if you are internationally motivated at all, you move it abroad because there are tax advantages to parking your intellectual property outside of the United States. As with Apple, of course. So the first thing that goes is your intellectual property. Then, of course, all of the things that you do to make the product to create additional value here might actually move abroad. So then, essentially, the value chain, a lot of the value still gets captured in the United States, but a lot of the value is being captured elsewhere. So that we have to ask ourselves as a society, are there things we can do at home to encourage more of the value of the innovation to stay in at home? And, and that's tax policy, that's training policy, that's research and development credits, that's patent boxes. There's a whole bunch of things you can try to do that countries are trying to do. But now to the broader thing, and this is something which is just correct, which is that a lot of the technology has been um, what economists might call skill biased. And it's skill biased in a way that it creates the demand for those with high level skills. It eliminates the demand for those with mid-level skills. What happens to people at the bottom? Well, actually, people at the bottom who cannot be uh, routinized away by a machine they're, they can do okay. So what you have is this polarization where the technology is driving opportunities at the top, driving opportunities at the bottom, and it's the middle that is most at risk. Well, that's true not just in the United States. That is true in the, all of the developed countries as a result of globalization and technology. I see that globalization technology is kind of the same thing. You can't have globalization without the technology. So there, um, And I think that's a big structural problem that, that the developed countries have to come to try to, to grip with, but, but understanding that the world is a very different place and whereas a middle income job in a developed country might have had a premium over uh, one in an emerging market country of you know four to five to six times as much, maybe over the next 20 years that premium is actually considerably less. Well, on that ambivalent note, Laura Tyson, thank you so much for appearing on TechCrunch TV. Thank you.